Grand Rounds. Today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Albert Waldo. Dr. Waldo received his Bachelor's of Arts at Cornell University and received his medical degree from State University of New York. His internship and residency was completed at Kings County Hospital Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York and Baltimore City Hospitals in Baltimore, Maryland, respectively. He then completed his chief residency here at Kings County Hospital Downstate Medical Center. His postdoctoral fellowship in cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology was completed at Columbia University. Dr. Waldo is the Walter H. Pritchard Professor of Cardiology, Professor of Medicine, and Professor of Biomedical Engineering at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, and currently serves as the Associate Chief of Cardiovascular Medicine for Academic Affairs. Dr. Waldo is a founding member and past president of the North American Society of Pacing and Electrophysiology, now known as the Heart and Rhythm Society. In addition to his clinical and research activities, Dr. Waldo holds committee memberships at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institutes, Cardiovascular A and B Study Section, the American Medical Association's Diagnostic and Therapeutic Technology Assessment Program, and numerous committees of the American College of Cardiology, including the Board of Governors. Dr. Waldo's research in the field of cardiac arrhythmias is well known with over 600 publications. He has participated in over 60 clinical trials and has been the recipient of numerous teaching and research awards. Please join me in welcoming today's speaker, Dr. Albert Waldo, as he continues his discussion on atrial fibrillation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Tina. So this is part two. Part one was last year. We talked about anticoagulation. And today we'll primarily be talking about so-called rate versus rhythm control for the management of atrial fibrillation. These are just some of my disclosures. So um, I think this is a good thing to start off with some of all those rules, because they're going to apply. Only a few of them here. But perfect's the enemy of good. You'll see why that's true in atrial fibrillation, because we don't have the perfect, we don't have the magic bullet yet for that. And this is one of my very favorites. A dog's a four-legged animal, but not every four-legged animal is a dog. And not all atrial fibrillation is the same. Things are never as good as it seemed or as bad as it seemed. That's Murphy's second law. I bet you didn't know that. And it's, it's better than his first law, which everyone knows if I can go wrong, it will. But this is really very good. Yes, we for a lot of days. And this is from Tennyson. And this is really important in medicine, but especially in atrial fibrillation. Knowledge comes, but wisdom lingers. And this is not new for you either. Life's a compromise. And that's what the, if, we, if you apply these rules, you'll do a very good job with atrial fibrillation, I guess. <coughs> okay, so let's just very briefly go over a, a little characterization of the rhythm, reminding you, because I showed this where This is a, the ECG, of course, with the irregular baseline and irregular ventricular response rates. And um, first, it's the, atrial fib is the most common sustained arrhythmia in the Western world. Um, 80% of the people with atrial fibrillation are 65 years of age or older right now. In fact, it's about 66. In the next few decades, two-thirds will, uh, will be over 75 and half over 80. I want to say that again. Two-thirds will be over 75 and half over 80. So this is remarkable. It's a, AFib is largely a disease and getting older. Uh, at present, a little more than 50% of individuals with atrial fibrillation are greater than 75 years of age. So two thirds, 65, half over, 70, over 75 right now. 50% of individual AF will be uh, 80 years old uh, in, in a little while. Okay, but the projected prevalence of AFib is 5.6 to 16 million Americans by the year 2050. So it's more than, more than double. Where we, where we are now is somewhere, I shall show you, about 7 million probably. probably. But this is really spectacular too. The lifetime incidence of atrial fibrillation is one in four people past the age of 40. This is from uh, the Framingham data. And I'll just show you some of that just because it's interesting. They, they looked at uh, uh, over 8,000 patients, so about roughly half and half, a little more women than men. Uh, they had no atrial fibrillation entry, and they, they were all over age 40 and followed until 1999, or the, the first AF event, uh, de uh, uh, death free of atrial fibrillation, or they reached the age of 99, or the last visit free of atrial fib. And you notice, uh, which each decade, there's still uh, the incidence of 25%, that's really remarkable. And then, uh, if you then subtract heart failure, you do a little better. 
And if you subtract heart failure, a myocardial infarction, you do better still. It's about one in, you know, one in five, one in six, one in six, really. And I, I put this up not just to show you the numbers because they're impressive, but to emphasize to you that comorbidities are a part of atrial fibrillation. They're very important. And treatment of, of the comorbidities will go a long way to minimizing the effects of atrial fibrillation. I think this is really important to emphasize. So this is one of the many um, types of uh, extrapolations from current databases. This is Miyasaka from Mayo Clinic from Olmsted County. And um, based on their projections, we're, we're here now in uh, about 2013 or so, right in here. So we're, depending on where you want to say we are on the scale, I think we're somewhere right around 7 million. And this is the year 2050. If AFib continues at its same incidence, it'll be over here. But it's more likely to, it's continuing to grow. And so it's more likely to be closer to 16 million people by the year 2050. So this is really important because this is a major part. One out of every 10 people who are over the age of 80 have atrial fibrillation. It's, it's really remarkable. So, we talked about stroke prevention before. We're not going to go into that today. Today we're going to talk about rate control versus rhythm control. And for rate control, uh, not too, not too uh, subtle here what we have to do. We, we have passive channel blockers, beta blockers, and digitalis, and amiloral can still be used for that. It's a very good amiloral blocking drug, although it's not usually a treatment of first choice or second choice. It's one more of, of frustration or desperation. But really, when you don't have to do that because we can actually add weight to his bundle and put in a pacemaker, and sometimes that's a good solution. But, and maintenance of sinus rhythm is difficult, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, these are the antirhythmic drugs. We'll go over that in some detail. The class 1As, um, quinidine, procanamide, dispyramide, not used too much anymore, if at all. The class 1Cs and the class 3s, the, we, this is propofenone and flecainide, basically, and we'll have all over the list. The class 3s, these are the potassium channel blockers, basically. Beta blockers occasionally work in some patients in whom the AFib is adrenergically mediated, but uh, that's not very common. And then non pharmacologic this is growing a lot. We'll talk about catheter ablation and surgical ablation to try and cure HU fibrillation. Pacing really doesn't do much, except that it might permit you to, by preventing bradycardia from drug therapy, from these drugs, it might permit you to suppress the atrial fibrillation while maintaining an adequate heart rate. The implantable AQ defibrillator um, is rarely used because even though the shocks used were less than five joules, they, the patient couldn't tell the difference between that and a 20 or 30 joule shock. And so uh, that, that's really not very much of the offering these days. So what are the drugs? Again, quinidine, procanamide, disuperamide, flecainide, propofenone, well, uh, propofenone SR, that's sustained release. It's a separate drug with a separate indication from, from the FDA. The class three drugs, amiodarone, dofenolide, dronetarone, the new guy uh, uh, around the block with some problems, and sodalone. These are what we have here. These are what we have. And um, what's interesting is to look at what the FDA uh, approvals are. They'll surprise you. For instance, you'll not see amiodarone here anywhere. It's the most widely used drug in the world, not just the United States, but in the world. It's probably the most effective drug against atrial fibrillation, not here. And most people forget how amiodarone was approved by the FDA. It's worth a moment. Back in the late 70s, early 80s, we didn't take care of uh, coronary artery disease as well as we do now. And we're still getting better at it. But there were an awful lot of infarcts, and there was an awful lot of ventricular tachycardia and an awful lot of people dying from ventricular tachycardia. And we used quinidine and procanamide, which were around at that time. By the way, you'll notice procanamide is not on this list either. But uh, they weren't very effective. And a new drug was born in, in Europe called amiodarone. Uh, this, it was originally uh, used for angina, and they noticed that the ventricular PVCs went away, and uh, they tried it as an angina drug. It turned out to be very effective. Everybody wanted it. And uh, it was brought into Cleveland, in fact, um, in, uh, at Metro. It was the first place in the United States that did that. But in order to get the drug, you had to get an NDA, a new drug application. And more and more hospitals wanted it. The only way they got it was an NDA. And there were hundreds of them around the country. No one was doing a clinical study. They were all doing it clinically, period. So uh, the FDA said to Sanofi, who had the drug, they said, look, do a clinical trial. We'll examine the data and we'll approve it if it makes sense and you know we'll understand the drug uh, as pluses and minuses. And Sanofi said, no, we're going to take the drug away. There was a huge outcry from the medical community. The FDA gave in and approved the amiodarone without a single review of any clinical trials or anything. Remarkable. Not so long ago either. 
And the community was glad to get it, but they never had any careful looks at the adverse effects, which are multiple. And uh, in any event, it's now widely used for atrial fibrillation. That's a story you should know. Now, but look at this, prevention of recurrent paroxysm of atrial fibrillation separates out paroxysm because you'll see the is over here for prevention of relapse of atrial fibrillation, that's recurrence, but uh, it's not here for paroxysmal because Pfizer, when they studied the drug, they, they had six different studies looking at paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. It was no different than placebo at the time. Now that's been challenged a little bit. It's widely used post-ablation now uh, by the ablators, but uh, it's, a good, it's a good drug. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about it, but uh, it's interesting. It's not in this list, and you see the ones in this list, Tecnai, Propofenone, Propofenone, Sustain, Release, Quinine, and so on. We hardly ever use that anymore. Now the new drug isn't even listed here. The most newly used drug for atrial fibrillation is Dronetarone. And look at this indication to reduce the risk of hospitalization for patients in sinus rhythm with a history of paroxysm or persistent atrial fibrillation. So the drug, we'll go over some of those data. The drug clearly is better than placebo. It is clearly effective than atrial fib, about the same efficacy as most of the other drugs we've got down here. But its indication is to decrease hospitalization. Very interesting. So it's really not on here for any of these things. So we go back to some old data because this is not new. This is from 1994. Harry Kreins, who's in the Dutch school, he's a terrific guy. And uh, these were study, studies followed patients for at least six months after cardioversion. And on no drug, you can see the recurrence, the, the, the sinus rhythm retention rate was 15 to 56%. Quinidine 11 to 54, diaspermide 44 to 54, propofenone 30 to 46. You just looked at all around. Amidrone was, you know, from 36 to 83. And flecainide looked like it was the best drug here. If you look at the mean, although uh, it's certainly a good drug, but I don't think it's more effective than amidrone, as I'll show you. But this is the problem. It's not for, none of these drugs are as effective as we'd like. So what are the problems with drugs? Poor long-term efficacy. The recurrence rate on a drug that even works in the beginning is uh, uh, is 50 percent recurrence rate within six to one, six months to one year, and 70 percent recurrence rate in two years. And that's leading me to a point that recurrence is not failure per se. We don't stop nitroglycerin because the patient gets angina. Uh, we don't have to stop these drugs because they have one recurrence. It depends. We'll talk about that in some way. So total AF prevention with antiviral drugs is unlikely. AF recurrences are likely in the absence of a reversible cause. A reversible cause might be hypothyroidism, for instance, is one obvious example. Uh, a treatment is palliative, not curative, with drug therapy, okay? Occasionally, you'll be lucky, you get complete suppression, but that's not the rule. And then what adverse effects, some of these drugs have endorphin toxicity, proarrhythmia, an increased risk of death, and proarrhythmia could be VT, for instance, that's not a lot of fun. Increased mortality with structural heart disease, especially heart failure, we use the, most of these drugs, not all, but most. And nuisance subjective adverse effects, and it may require discontinuation because of inefficacy or side effects because of the adverse, because of the adverse effects. So this is that slide I always love to show, I call it idealide. It, if a drug had more than 95% efficacy, it was safe in all patients, including those with structural heart disease. It was atrial selective. It didn't affect the vegetables at all. It didn't cause any poor in the organ toxicity. There were no interactions with drugs or food or devices. To, you know, these drugs often increased the defibrillation threshold. It was a plethora of preparation available also. Once a day dosing, outpatient initiation, moderate price. If that were the case, I wouldn't be lecturing today. Everyone would be using Idealine. And, and uh, we will all be very happy. But none of this, none of this is true, unfortunately. None of this is true. So you see, life is a compromise. <laughs> and so, and, 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 and Murphy's second will reply, if things are never as good as they seem or as bad as you seem. And we'll, we'll show some of that. And then Tennyson, about knowledge comes with wisdom lingers, that, that really applies. So um, for a long time, the notion was that when you had atrial fibrillation, you brought the patient to, uh, to your clinic or to a hospital, your outpatients, your inpatients, and you said, okay, um, we'll put your rhythm back to normal, or if it's paroxysmal, or in then we'll try and suppress the atrial fibrillation. If those things don't work, there's always rate control. But the, then the affirm trial came along. The atrial fibrillation follow-up investigation of rhythm management, the atrial, the, NIH trial began in 1995, ended in 2001, and they decided to see if a rate control was a, a valid primary therapeutic option. 
and that had never been tested before. And the other thing that was unique about this study is that if you, uh, patients were randomized, the endpoint was all cause mortality, and patients were randomized to the strategy of rate control versus rhythm control. So if you were on the, on the rhythm control, you did your best to maintain sinus rhythm. You did, if you, the rhythm recurred, the cardio rhythm, the patient kept on the same drug or went to drug B, you could even go all the way to ablation. You didn't give up. And the idea was that one, that one recurrence is, is, not per, is not failure per se. It could be for some patients, but not failure. And the rhythm control, of course, was easy. You, do, you could uh, you just not worry about the rhythm. Even if it was paroxysmal, just treat the patient for persistent or permanent atrial fibrillation. And for paroxysmal, too, when they recur, you didn't want their rates 130 or 140 ventricular rate. You wanted it less than 100. And in this trial, we said less than 80. We'll get to that in a moment. And when the trial ended, it took a long time. The trial went to six years. Patients had to be followed a minimum of two and was event driven. And there weren't that many deaths. So very interesting, not that many deaths. And when you look at the data, and this is the New England Journal article, the p value being 0.08, a very significant trend, if you will, but not significant. More people were dying in the rhythm control arm than the rate control arm. Now, the hypothesis was that we were better off and rate and, and sinus rhythm and rate control. But it wasn't looking that way. And it turned out that this was largely due to uh, cancer. We didn't anticipate that. And it turned out this was the third consecutive trial, another one an NIH trial on, uh, on uh, 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 secondary prevention of ventricular tachycardia, in which patients were randomized to amiodarone, soda oil, or an ICD. And there was a European trial, uh, post-MI trial, called AMIAC, in which excess mortality was in the amiodarone arm was all due to cancer. Nobody has really followed that much, and they should. People ask me what kind of cancer. We don't really know. But I, I like to emphasize that because uh, it's not intuitive. A lot of people don't think about all the adverse effects of amiodarone, and this is one of the things that perhaps we should be worrying about with this drug. But in any event, it surely shows that rate control and with the control are equivalent. People didn't expect that. So let me ask you a question that I often asked before I started lecture, but today in the middle. Is there anybody here who volunteered to be in atrial fibrillation? Nobody ever volunteers. And it says a lot for a lot of reasons that if you could achieve atrial fibrillation, sinus rhythm safely and effectively, you'd like to do it. We, can, we, don't want to spend, we are already half finished with the lecture, so we don't want to spend that much time talking about that. We can in questions. But I, I, what is intuitive about that is right. By the same token, because it's so difficult to maintain sinus rhythm, sometimes it's not a bad thing to leave the patient in rate control as a primary therapeutic option. And, and surely, even in patients that we can be trying, and you see it's patients being rehospitalized for problems, having lots of symptoms, they might be much better off in, in rate control as a permanent treatment. And this is a major thing. As well, there were other studies that did this as well. And this is the AFCHF trial. This was a trial, atrial fibrillation, a the affirm trial, but in heart failure patients. There were very few heart failure patients in the affirm trial. There were some, but it was just a tick. And they, they couldn't have serious ventricular dysfunction in that trial. So this was done by the Canadian government. There were almost 1,400 patients with a left ventricular ejection fraction of 35 or less with symptomatic heart failure with the New York Heart Association functional class two or higher, two to four, and a history of atrial fib, randomized to rhythm and rate control with a minimum follow-up of two years. Primary endpoint was cardiovascular mortality. Secondary endpoints, you can see, was a combination of things. But the hypothesis was that in heart failure, you would definitely were better off in sinus rhythm. That to be a, in fact, it was predicted that to be a two-fold increase in mortality if you were in the, rhythm, in the rate control arm. In the rate control arm. Well, when the trial ended, this is what happened. There was no difference at all. None, no difference at all. And what's interesting about that is why. And the major reason I think can be seen here, this is almost unheard of, how well treated the comorbidities were and how well treated stroke prevention was. And so just going back for a moment to, to the uh, AFFIRM trial. In the AFFIRM trial in 1995, we already knew that it was hard to treat atrial fibrillation that tended to recur. And we knew that atrial fibrillation was a cause associated with stroke. But the, the mantra at the time was, one of the reasons you should be in sinus rhythm is you don't have to be on anticoagulation. Because you're not in fibrillation, why take it? The trouble is they had recurrences. And when recurrences, they got strokes. And it turns out that in the rhythm control arm, two-thirds of the patients who got strokes were not on the drug. And, uh, and the other, uh, the rest of them who got atrial fibrillation were 
had an INR that was less than two. So it said that if, even though you, you were in a rhythm control management strategy because fibrillation tends to be carried out to be protected, we have to remember that. And that's the most I'm going to say at the moment about anticoagulation today. But what, look at this. In this study, um, if you look at, at anticoagulation, you can see that, well, let's start at the top. Um, well, you see 82% are amniobrone, by the way. This is heart failure. Part, that's partly why. Um, beta blockers, 80 to 80 percent, 88% were on beta blockers. This is good treatment of heart failure. In fact, beginning in 2000, 2001, the 21st century, we learned how to treat heart failure so much better with, with drug therapy. And look at, look at that. If you look at the at ACE inhibitors, uh, over 80 percent, and then you add the arms, you put these two together, that's 95, 96 percent of the patients were on afterload reduces. Diuretics, over 80 percent. Even spironolactone is very good, almost 50 percent. And look at that. 88% of the patients in the rhythm control arm and 92% of the rate control arm are on anticoagulation. We know from study after study, you're lucky if 40 to 60% of patients who have the indication for anticoagulation and no contraindication even get it. They don't. So this study took very, very, very good care. And the stat is almost half the patients. This took very good care of the comorbidities. And as a result, you, you saw what happened. This is what happened. And you, and you broke it down to all the subgroups. They were digestible. I could have put up that slide too. It looks just like this. So that's very, very important. I can't emphasize that too much. And then if you look at this, there's a firm that took about race, uh, uh, AFCHF race with a Dutch trial of about a little under 600 patients published at the same time as the firm. Very similar and the same results. And a bunch of small studies um, that were mostly, that were all pilot studies that didn't go to to a full study because they had, they was, everything was showing the same thing. Even in the pilot studies, there was no difference in outcome between weight and rhythm. So for sure, rhythm control strategy was, is not superior to rate control in terms of outcome. Appropriate choice therapy should be based on each patient's symptoms and disease. This doesn't say rate control is better, please, it doesn't. Fa the American uh, Family Practice Association, I think that's what they're called, and the American College of Physicians said rate control is the treatment of choice. Well, if you don't want to see your patients often and you want to keep them out of hospital easily, it may be. Is it better for patients? I really think this is the answer myself, and maybe we'll have time to look at it. I think you don't abandon the patients. There are many patients I've had, uh, who, who I've seen the patient the first time, no one ever gave them a trial in sinus for them. I've seen young people like that. And uh, you can do very well, I, I, and uh, we can spend more time on why you might want to. But again, rate control is a legitimate primary therapy option. I don't want to deny that either. But this is really the best evidence, I think, for why you might seriously consider rhythm control if you think it should be important. This is the first anti-rhythmic drug study of the AFFIRM trial. So the AFFIRM trial had an opportunity to head-to-head uh, -head compare the efficacy of all the anti-rhythmic drugs. So if you got randomized to the rhythm control arm, you can be on any of those drugs I showed you at the beginning, the type 1, the class 1, 1 A's, 1 C's, or class 3's, with an option of the physician and the patient. But in 80 of the 213 sites in this trial, they were further randomized uh, to the drug. You got randomized to rhythm control, okay, now we're going to randomize you to your drug. And so the end point of this trial was at the end of one year, uh, who was still in sinus rhythm on the drug to which they were randomized, had not been cardioverted and was still in sinus rhythm. And so you got randomized either to amiodarone, to sodorol, or to your choice of a class one agent. And if you look here comparing any of the class one agents, the, the yellow portion here are the ones who were still in sinus rhythm on the same drug that had not been cardioverted. And uh, you can see uh, amiodarone swamped the class one drugs, amiodarone swamped sodorol, and there was no significant difference between sodorol class one drugs. But look at this, if you look at the strategy, if you, you can cardiovert and keep them on the same drug, that's the aqua color here, or you can switch them from drug one to drug two, and at the end of the year, about 80% of patients are in sinus rhythm. That's not so bad. And I have a bunch of patients like that who come in occasionally even for cardioversion, because many of these patients will be paroxysmal with their birth themselves. I mean, just yesterday, one of my patients emailed me that he was back in rhythm after he emailed me the day before he was out of rhythm. And that happens two or three times a year, that's just fine. He's happy and I'm happy. So, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. 
That's one of my rules. And I think this tells you why. And this is a prospective randomized controlled trial uh, in a lot of patients. So the prevalence is on for them at one year. Okay. So how do we put that together? What is the measure of successful treatment of atrial fibrillation as with heart failure or angina? Success in managing AFib can be defined as a decrease in frequency of episodes, duration of episodes, and symptoms during episodes. Recurrence is not ipso facto drug failure, plus antibiotic drug efficacy is not measured simply by time to first recurrence. That's good for the statisticians, and it's not without some meaning. I mean, if you have recurrence three times in the first week after you start therapy, you have a pretty good answer. But time to recurrence tells you something, but it's, I've had many patients, the first time they recur, it's maybe in two months. But we carry it with them quickly, or they return quickly, and the next time they recur, it's six or eight months. That has to do with remodeling. The longer you design it, you reverse remodel the adverse effects of the very rapid rate of the atrial. Atrial rate in atrial fibrillation is about 350 beats per minute. You can guess that's not good for the atrium. That's where the atrium dilates. You get a tachycardia, immediate cardiomyopathy in the atrium. You get fibrosis, and, and that's the thing. The fibrosis is not going to remodel, but the atrium will shrink in sinus rhythm, and that's important. So anyway, uh, I, I, I think the point is that recurrence has decreased. We saw that in the, in the atrial defibrillator trials. That's a New England Journal article. We saw it because with the atrial defibrillator, the automatic defibrillator, you got cardioverted almost immediately. Some people, we let go to sleep at night and cardioverted them in their sleep so they didn't feel the shock. But still, from the time from the first shot to the first recurrence, then you work to the second recurrence to prolong, the third recurrence really prolonged, and so you get better that way. So this is all understanding fibrillation and perfect the enemy of good. But it's not, we're not going to find anything perfect, and we don't have ideal life. So what is good rhythm control? No atrial fibrillation is great, continue the drug, and you have that in some patients. I have a few, not a lot, I have a few. Marked decrease in atrial fibrillation frequency, excellent, continue the drug. Modest decrease in atrial fibrillation, good to fair, consider drug change. No, ch no change, well, that's not very good. Consider either a, a change in drug or a change in strategy. You might want to go to rate control, or you might want to go to ablation. So that leads us to the guidelines. And these are the guidelines for the American Heart Association, the American Heart and Cardiology Foundation now, American Heart Association, the Heart Rhythm Society. And um, if, you, if you choose sinus rhythm, this is now a safety-driven approach. They look at whether you have no or minimal uh, heart disease. This is, we're now talking basically about comorbidities. This is an alphabetical order they list Jordanerone, Flecodine, Papaphenone, Sodor is first choice. You notice Amidon is down here, it's the second choice. That's not what happens in most communities, it's in the drinking water in most communities, Amidon. <laughs> so, you, but Amidon, and Dofenol is down here, not because it's not a good drug, but because I've got a relatively narrow therapeutic tox, uh, rate, uh, toxicity, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic toxic ratio. And that's because this drug uh, is renally excreted and in the presence of, of any renal decompensation, you have to be very careful. And QT prolongation is what this drug does. You don't want that because you can get to a sod. And until we very carefully um, manage that, they had a, a, a lot of to a sod and a lot of deaths. When you manage that, it does very well. If this hospital, because of that, and when Pfizer first put the drug out, this in this hospital, if you want to order the drug, you have to call one of the EP people. No one else is allowed to do it. You have to take a test. A little extreme, maybe, but it's a, it is a good drug. Okay, and catheter ablation is gaining, we're going to talk about that at the end of my lecture. Now, if you have hypertension, you want to know if you have substantial left ventricular hypertrophy or not. Uh, that's regarded as, a, by most of us, as a left ventricular wall thickness of 1.4 centimeters. Dr. Hoyt might want to comment about that. But it's really in the eyes of the beholder. A couple of years ago, we actually listed it as 1.4, but there were too many uh, people who thought that shouldn't be done. But if you think there isn't, then the same, the same drugs is up here. Again, look around the road is down here, and the phenylide also. And then both of these also offer catheter ablation. You'll see all these, all these as a second choice, all these things are going to offer catheter ablation, so we're going to get to that. And then if you have coronary disease, because you can't, we learned from the AFFIRM trial, we didn't talk about all the implications of the AFFIRM trial, I mean of the CASH trial, sorry, we didn't talk about that. But you can't get the 1C drugs in the presence of ischemic heart disease because proarrhythmia is really important. So uh, that limits you to the federalized dronetarone or sodorol, and then if that doesn't work, I see this move a little, I just noticed that now. But you see the amiodarone or catheter ablation. So coronary artery disease, okay. And if you have heart failure, amiodarone or dofenolol, right, and nothing else. And that's because these other drugs are negative mitotropes and 
Jordanolone, I'll show you some data. If you give it to patients heart failure, it, it, it has very bad out, outcomes. If it's a big time calcium channel blocker, that's probably one of the major reasons why. So uh, this is a good flow diagram, and most of us use this. So let me tell you just a little about the drugs. Uh, this is um, the CTAP trial done in Canada. It, it compares amiodarone with propofenone and sodal. That's a 1C and an other class 3 drug. Amiodarone always wins. But you see, amiodarone's not that great in this study in 600 days. Of, the recurrence rate in, in selected patients, this wasn't every, for every comer, you can see it was still maybe uh, in somewhere in the 70% range. And this is somewhere in the 40% in the, uh, range or so. And this is about right. This is what you see. But my point is if you're on Sotorol or you're on Propofol, recurring verb. Unless the symptoms are too bad, the frequency is too much, that sort of thing. You don't have to go to this right away if at all. Okay. And this is the sapphire ID, which is a dofenolide trial, it shows that the higher the dose, the more the efficacy. And in this trial, they actually in selected patients, the properly selected patients, they had an efficacy rate above 60%. And, and when you, I did emphasize on the things I showed you, dofenolide is also indicated for cardioversion. It has about a 40 or 45% efficacy rate for cardioversion. I'm really not going to talk much about cardioversion. The, the other drugs that we use for cardio, the other drug we use for cardioversion is uh, IV, ibutylide. Uh, I, I probably should spend a little time on it. Maybe at this time at the end we can go back. But, um, so this is a, a dofenolide is a good drug. It's just an allotherapeutic toxic ratio. So you've got to bring every patient to the hospital for that. And you keep them in three days. And you have to make sure the QT is okay, the renal function is okay. You have to follow it. And in fact, the same black box warning that, that dofenolide got on the, on the package insert and the PDR, if you read it, the same thing for Sotolol, because it has the same issues. It's really excreted, and not quite the same narrow therapy to toxic ratio as Ophenolide, but there's still enough to aside they mandate that you bring them in for at least 48 hours, because of it's half-cut 48 hours. Okay. So inpatient versus outpatient management becomes important. And the ones you can give safety as an outpatient are the 1C drugs, dronetarone, and amulet. So this is the diamond trial. Um, I put this on because it's going to introduce a little bit about the uh, dronetarone in a moment. But this was uh, a trial done by Pfizer with dofenolide. Now, Pfizer knew already from the, the CASH trial and from other trials that you can't give the 1C drugs in the face of heart failure or the face of ischemic heart disease. And they wanted to be able to give their drug to patients with these uh, diseases. And they wanted to show that it was safe. And dofenolide is a pure IKR blocker. That's all it does. And in fact, by prolonging the, the QT into it, it, it's an inotropic agent. So uh, minor, but it does. So they did the diamond trial, which was patients within uh, one week, uh, within one month of hospitalization for heart failure or some other criteria for heart failure, and they randomized them. Uh, they, they were being treated for other things, but they also just put them on the federal. You didn't have to have atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. They just put them on or placebo and to look for mortality, no difference at all. And then they, this was in one, within one week of an infarct, they put them on dofenolide or placebo, and they got the usual other treatments, and there was no difference at all. So the FDA was very happy and said, okay, you can give this drug to heart failure patients, you can give this drug to ischemic heart disease patients. So that, we'll see why that was important in a minute. So now we get to dronetarone. This was introduced uh, in, the, in the 21st century. It's the only drug introduced in the last decade. And um, they did their two primary started, pivotal trials that the FDA calls it to show that they're better than placebo. The Uridus and the Brahmish trials, this was essentially in Europe, South Africa, Australia, and Argentina. And this was, uh, uh, Adonis was the United States and Canada. And basically the same thing, same endpoint. And you can see that uh, dronetarone was significantly better, 0 0.001, than placebo. Not that great, but you can see the recurrence rate was, uh, you know, 360 in a year was about 40%, just like all the other drugs. We'll look at that in a moment. Um, so the, they went to the FDA and said, we have our two pivotal trials, are better than placebo, approve us. And this is, by the way, time for first recurrence, which was how, how everyone was doing trials back then. Uh, uh, and the FDA said, well, we want to know how, how, how safe you are. Now, by the way, I want to emphasize that, that uh, almost two-thirds of the patients had no symptomatic recurrence at one year. So this drug controls ventricular response rate well. So patients, when they were infant, often didn't know it. And we try, one of the things we want to do is relieve symptoms, make patients feel better. So that might be a good idea. But this is now comparing the efficacy of a whole bunch of drugs. This is a CTAP trial I showed you. The safety trial was a VA trial looking at all the beta blockers and solar versus amiodarone. And uh, you can see that uh, 
Amiodarone beats everybody. The, these are the, all the trials now with the dronetarone. But look at that. If you look at these other drugs, they're all about the same, about 40% efficacy uh, over time. That's really uh, with the time to first recurrence measurement. So if you go back to what I told you, that first antidemic drug study in the AFFIRM trial, we showed at the end of one year, it was really 80%. You can only cardiovert the patient and keep them on the same drug or go to drug B from drug A. The strategy is important. So this is a whole bunch of drugs now. So what about Jonetarone? It's worth a moment. There are a lot of lessons in this. It's, a, it's very much like Amiodarone. In fact, it's son of Amiodarone. They tried to get rid of some of the adverse effects from Amiodarone. It's not an iodinated compound. The pulmonary fibrosis that has seen you syncratic with Amiodarone is thought to do the iodine. That 40% of the patients who take Amiodarone to thyroid abnormalities, either hypo or hypothyroid, mostly hypo, but also hyper. So they thought that would get rid of it. Um, and uh, but it's a multi it's multi channel blocking it blocks sodium it blocks potassium it's a calcium channel blocker and it's a beta blocker just like amiodarone um, and um, but they studied this drug very well this was Daphne was a dose ranging study which made the drug 400 milligrams twice a day if you went higher you didn't get more efficacy you got more side effects they never tested a lower dose and these are the two studies I just showed you Erato uh, and these other trials showed it was very good at weight control. And then they did Andromeda. Now Andromeda was just like the diamond trials I showed you. The FDA wanted to know if you, after they looked at Eurydice and Adas, is your drug safe? So they said, we're gonna do a diamond trial. In fact, they could have called it diamond instead of Dofetoide, they could have been Dronetarol. That was one of these. the D's. Second D in diamond was Denmark, where they did the study. So they went to the same hospitals, same endpoints. And um, they, they randomized patients who didn't have to be in atrial fibrillation or And this way, they looked at patients in heart failure. So we said the past month they had to be hospitalized for heart failure or uh, they were about to be actively treated for and been recently decompensated is the bottom line. In any event, the trial was stopped early. I'll show you the data in a moment because there was an excess mortality this time. There were 25 deaths on dronetarone and there were only 12 on placebo. We'll, we'll see that. So they said, okay, the FDA said, well, we're not happy that it happened, but we're happy because now we know who shouldn't get the drug. So we have to know the limitations. That's not a bad thing. But we still want to know how safe you are. So they did Athena. Athena was a, was a study in which they just looked at, at keeping people out of hospital. They, didn't, they already knew they could suppress it, but the end point was decreased cardiovascular hospitalizations. And that's why they got that indication. So in Athena, they found that it prolongs the time the first cardiovascular hospitalization of death in moderate to high risk patients with atrial fibrillation. And it provided a paradigm shift in how we think of the therapies in AF. We weren't thinking about just suppression, we were thinking about hospitalization. In this era, we're keeping people out of hospital and course control is important. That was important. And the, the Dionysus was a comparison with amiodarone and Jordanone. You have to do that for approval in Europe, and they did that and they got approved. It, the, the, uh, I mean, amiodarone was a little better with efficacy, but a lot worse with side effects, which is what they predicted. But in this trial, in this trial, and I'll show you the data in a moment, um, they saw something which they didn't expect. In Athena, all patients had to be in sinus rhythm or had to be cardioverted to sinus rhythm. But in, there were 4,600 some odd patients, more than the AFFIRM trial. It's in fact, the largest AFFIRM drug trial. And um, they saw that in a little under 500 patients, uh, two thirds of whom were on placebo, one third of whom were on dronetarone, every time they came to the clinic, they were in fibrillation. And in these patients, I'll show you the data in a moment, they did very well. So this was a theme, and that's what I'm saying. The general is superior to placebo in reducing the occurrence of cardiovascular hospitalization and death from any cause in high-risk patients with fibrillation of flutter. And um, it did it, 24% lower risk reduction, as you can see, P value 0.001. And when you looked at a lot of things, it was really interesting. If you look, it was a 24%, I just showed you, cardiovascular hospitalization of death, 0.001, there was a 29% decrease in the risk of death from cardiovascular causes, primarily due to a 45% decrease in arrhythmic death. So they thought it was decreasing ventricular arrhythmias as well. Overall mortality was similar in both groups. Uh, there was a 37% decrease in hospitalization for atrial fibrillation, a 30% decrease in acute coronary syndrome. So it uh, turns out dronetarone is a vasodilator just like amiodarone, and it looked like it was good in ischemic heart disease. It even lowered the blood pressure about six points because it's a vasodilator. So they were thinking they had a pleomorphic effect. This is a pretty good drug, a similar adverse effect ratio uh, between placebo and the drug, and they were very happy. So was the, so was the FDA, and they approved the drug. 
And just to show you some of those things again, there was a less stroke, significant. Stroke with TIA, significant less. If you look at acute coronary syndrome, uh, cardiovascular death and stroke, it was less. If you look at stroke or uh, acute coronary syndrome and all-cause death, less. So the trend was a good. Fatal stroke, no, no significant difference for the trend. So um, then we looked at these data. Those patients I told you, the, uh, under, fi under 500 patients, who every time they came, they were in atrial fibrillation. And look at that. They had a 26% relative risk reduction, just like, in fact, a little better than the patients who were in sinus rhythm. So they said, maybe we can give this drug to everybody with atrial fibrillation. My judgment, no one told me this, I'm just guessing, but I think uh, marketing, uh, marketing's eyes lit up and the dollar signs were right there and they said, we can give it to anybody in atrial fibrillation. And against the advice of a lot of folks, they, they did a, a study called PALACE. And the PALACE study, I want to show you one of the mistakes they did. didn't study it in the, in the, in the Athena population, which, is, which would have made sense. They studied it in the Andromeda population, and the patients who, who had, look at that, there's 70% of the patients had heart failure, for instance. And look what happened really quickly. You look at these data, you can see in every, in Athena, you can see Geronderone was better when they looked at everything, but in Pallas, it was the exact opposite. And the Geronderone was much significantly worse. In fact, when you look at every single category, deaths, cardiovascular death, arrhythmic death, stroke, uh, except for MI, the, uh, uh, unplanned hospitalization heart failure, they did worse. This is a big black eye for the drug, but I, in my opinion, they gave it to the wrong patients. However, when you look at those guidelines again, and, and this, these, these uh, I'm sorry, these arrows are still out of place, it didn't change one lick. If you had no minimal heart disease, adrenaline's okay, uh, that's why I left the, R, the, the uh, yellow here, the highlighted. If you, uh, if you have hypertension, Trinetto is still okay as long as you don't have LVH, you have coronary disease, it's still okay, and don't give it to heart failure. That's what it said before, that's what it said again. So I think instead of just saying the drug's worthless, which is what a lot of people said, I think use it right, use it right, and it's still a legitimate primary therapy option. The other thing I want to emphasize are two things. One, amiodarone is always a second choice except in severe LVH or in heart failure. Again, it's not used first. So, um, I'm running close to being sure. I quickly want to go over this because I think it's worth remembering. And the patient who only has occasional episodes, so you have to keep on ending with drugs all the time. So there's what we call the pill in the pocket, which means when you get atrophib, pop a couple of pills and you'll be, will you be cardioverted. And it turns out that very good studies were done in Italy, Albonia, they were a very good group, and um, they, they, um, they gave it to patients either uh, 300 milligrams of fecondine, that's double the normal dose, the maximum normal dose, or 600 milligrams of propofenone, that's also double the normal single dose. And uh, as soon as you get it, and um, the, the end point was the onset of symptoms to, uh, to, uh, 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 to drug injection. It's a, for 36 minutes, palpitations stopped in less than six hours, 94% of the patients. The time to symptom resolution after drug ingestion, uh, uh, under two hours. Drug terminated all episodes with, or within a patient, 84% of the time. Adverse drug effects occurred at least once, 7%. Look pretty good. And it is pretty good. In fact, if you, if you look at this another way, the pill in the pocket, the, the mean monthly events one year prior to follow versus the fit period after the we were on the pill in the pocket, before symptomatic AF episodes, 59.8. During follow-up, 54.5. So the same number of episodes. Calls to the emergency room, this was uh, almost half the patients here, only less than 5%. And hospitalizations, 15% hospitalizations, le less than 2%. This is a pretty good thing to do. You have to make sure the patients are on an even or blocking drug because these, these uh, drugs can cause H.U. flutter and slow the flutter rate and get one-to-one -one conduction. So you don't do this uh, without some care, uh, but it's a, it's a nice handy thing to remember. So this is the pill of the pocket. It, it was that patient, no left ventricular dysfunction, or ischemic heart disease. That's because of uh, the 1C drugs, you can't do that. Okay, infrequent symptomatic episodes of parasitic atrial fibrillation, systolic heart pressure at least 100 millimeters of mercury, and arresting heart rate and sinus rate of 70 beats per minute. Understanding of how and when to take the medication. The reason it's 70 is because these drugs will affect sinus node function. So if it will really impact, if you have beta card to begin with, say 50 in the 50s, you give these drugs, they'll come out at very slow rates, and that's not a good thing. So a nice treatment.
So now we're going to, at the end, and we're going to go for rate control. And this is really pretty straightforward now, a lot of data. Um, this was the affirmed trial data that you wanted to keep, uh, with exercise, you wanted to keep it uh, less than 110 beats per minute and at rest less than 80. Uh, in the race trial, they just want you less than 100 beats per minute, didn't matter what. In race two, I'm gonna show you those data in a moment. They upped it a little to 110 beats uh, with exercise. And, uh, and then if you look at, uh, 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 this is a race two uh, strict control. This is mimicking the affirmed trial. And race two leading control, just 110. So they wanted less than 80 at rest for strict control, less than 110 with exercise. And with race two, they just wanted less than 110. And the guidelines were all over the place. They, they followed mostly the affirmed trial. So what's the point? The point was that there were, there were no real data. And the intuition was that you should have rates less than 80, and that's what the affirmed trial did at rest. And the intuition was that with that exertion, activity of daily living, you shouldn't go over 110. But when they examined the data and compared it to a more lean strategy in race, two, in race one, which only said less than 100, a lot of patients got pacemakers, for instance, one got a hospitalization, because to get the rate during atrial fibrillation low enough, you had to give a beta blocker or a cast channel blocker, so that when the sinus should impact the sinus don't function, so now the rates were 45 and 50, and now you needed a beta, and now you needed a pacemaker. So if you were willing to let them be a little faster, a whole lot less pacemakers, and they did just fine. And then race two was a prospective study to do that. So um, there was no standard. So that, but what's interesting is that if you look at the affirm trial, the mean ventricular rate age was 78, and in race one it was 84, and the, the second study, a prospective study, the lenient rate was 94, the mean rate was 94 at the beginning of the study, but by the time it ended, it was 86. That should be an eight, I'm sorry, I missed that. And the mean rate was 86. So what's the point? The point is that most stocks say it should be less than 100, and most stocks say they're comfortable, most comfortable with the rates below 90, but that, not to worry too much. And then you have a lot less hospitalization, a lot less need for face which is important. So this is just summarizing rate control. The affirm trial, less than 80 at rest. Uh, in a six minute walk test, less than 110 beats per minute. 24 hour hold to less than 100 beats per minute on average. And a maximum, less than 110% of predicted maximum heart rate and exercise testing. Very, very rigid and probably too rigid. The race was like the affirm trial originally, a uh, smaller number of patients, a little over 500 in the Netherlands, but they were very liberal. Jesus said 100 beats per minute or less than 100. And uh, remember, it wound up being a mean of 84. This wound up being a mean of 78. If you look at race two, they said, well, maybe even 110 is okay. Let's see, it turned out it was. And when they looked at, uh, but when they looked at the uh, lenient, this is 110, when they looked at the strict, they wanted less than 80 at rest, the same problem happened. A lot of patients got pacemakers, a lot of patients got hospitalized. So they decided this is better. So the ESC guidelines already adopted this, and it got published right after that. Now the U European Society of Cardiology guidelines say if your rate control is just less than 110. But I remind you that even in race two, the mean rate was 86. So not too many people over 100 for sure. And so um, I think I really said everything here um, already. Okay, so now let's just spend the last bit of time on ablation. We don't need to spend a lot of time because I, I just want to make a few major points. First, we don't understand the mechanism of atrial fibrillation very well. Gordon Moe, who was a, a pupil here, and he was a, a, a postdoctoral fellow here we, uh, uh, with Wiggers a long time ago, went and went, became very famous and did his work in uh, Syracuse and later at, in Utica at the Masonic Temple. He did some studies in vaguely mediated atrial fibrillation and thought atrial fibrillation would do multiple reentry wavelengths, a so called random reentry. That should be an O. Oh my goodness, mistake. Random reentry. A bunch of these things going around and. and um, that became widely accepted without any, without any mapping data at all. And uh, my, my PhD student, we published it, in fact, it got published last month. Uh, and we showed, when we finally mapped it with our 512 electrodes in the age, this wasn't operative at all. It was single foci firing very rapidly in new paradigm. So th this is really, a lot of people think it still may be present in humans, but we really don't know. Most of us think that there's something that when the atrial fibrillation is generated by something in the, in the atrial tissue itself, something going very fast, like one or more drivers, like multiple foci firing, a single focus firing, maybe a reentry circuit firing very fast, a multiple reentry circuits firing very fast. But it's hard because we, we, mapping atrial fibrillation is hard because every beat is different. 
we've learned about all these other A rhythmias, flutter, A B node reentry, A, A B reentry, and W P W S sort of thing, because every beat is actually the same way. It's a constant rate and a constant actuation sequence. So with the techniques we can use in patients, especially in the path lab, uh, you can map that from beat to beat and you can put it together. But in fit, you really can't do that. So um, what we know, what we all that we do know is that the triggers that mostly start the atrial fibrillation, and, and the pulmonary veins principally, but not exclusively, all, about 87% in the pulmonary veins, about another 13% elsewhere in the spirometer cava, sometimes around the coronary sinus. And, um, and the autonomic nervous system probably does play some role. But anyway, on the basis of, of the multi-answer weight of theory, a surgeon named Jimmy Cox, uh, in, in 1991, published this article in which he did the maze procedure. It was called the maze because he made a lot of incisions in the atrium. This is superior cave, inferior vena cave. These are the pulmonary veins. This is cut out just to show the endocardium of the left ventricle, the left atrium. I mean, and he said, if the multi inches weightless, I can make an incision, sew it up, heal by fibrosis, scar doesn't conduct, and these multi inches weightless are going to keep hitting dead ends, and they won't be able to to continue and will cure AFib. It's called the maze because he still wanted the sinus impulse to get to the AV node in some way, but it had to go by circuitous routes because of all these incisions he made. Well, it seemed to work. But about eight years later, and this is uh, 1998, Hessegger and France showed that the pulmonary veins are the source of the triggers that initiate atrophy. And this is still the case. And so what people started to do is to try and isolate these things. But we, and what was interesting, if you go back to what Jimmy Cox did, the first thing he did is I say the pulmonary veins. He, when he asked about it, he said, well, it was an obvious target, so he did it. But he didn't, it was totally imperfect. It may have been the most important thing he did, whether all these reasons were necessary or helpful or whatever, we still don't know. But the ablators mimic these sorts of things with lots of empiric therapy. And, um, and that's where we are now. We haven't advanced beyond the Hessinger and Jimmy Cox in our understanding the mechanism. So the ablation that we do, the only thing that's data-driven is to try and isolate the pulmonary veins. But when we treat atrial flutter, we don't isolate the pulmonary veins. We go, we, with laser-like approach, we isolate the, we, we ablate the cable tricuspidesis because that puts a roadblock in the reentrant circuit. Can't make flutter. For AV node reentry, we don't go for the premature beats that start the, a, the a AVNRT. We go for the so-called slow pathway because there's a reentrant circuit in the AV node, the fast and, and the two pathways, and we, we ablate the slow pathway so there's no more no circle, no more reentrant circuit, no more AVNRT. In WPW, Wolf Parkinson so White, we ablate the accessory connection so there's no more AVRT. We don't have such a target in atrial fibrillation. We simply don't. So when you look at the data, the reported success in surgical ablation is 70 and 90%, the rigor of follow-up, I didn't put enough question marks down there. It's mostly uh, the surgeon calling the referring doc, who, and usually the patients even in another city, how is Mr. or Mrs. Smith? Oh, they're doing great, good, sign this room. I mean, that's not very rigorous. That, I guarantee you that happens unabashedly uh, uh, sometimes. It may be appropriate in patients with atrial fibrillation undergoing cardiac surgery. In fact, it's, it's uh, considered uh, right now uh, the standard of care. Minimally invasive modifications are now available. So there, there was maze one, there's maze two, maze three, maze four. They're all variations of the same empiric approach without a target. Okay. Catheter ablation at a 70% success rate that's atrial fibrillation for one year or more, but the definition of success has been very variable. Is it free of any drugs, or if you give a drug that, that works after ablation that didn't work before, is that success? Uh, and then it turns out that, as I'll show you, most of the success is in patients who are very young, a middle a age in the middle 50s, who have no underlying structural heart disease, and who have parasitic atrial fibrillation. The rest is not as successful. Most studies are limited to select patient population. It's still unclear with the long-term successes that I'll show you in the complication rate. Duration of anticoagulation therapy post ablation is of some interest. Can you ever stop warfarin if you still have or and now have the new anticoagulants, which are, I think, better than warfarin for the most part. I, I, when I see a new patient, I virtually always offer one of the new anticoagulants as first choice. So uh, these are these are have a, the new anticoagulants have advantages, but do you need anticoagulation post ablation in patients who have risk factors still? And I'll show you the answer is yes, by the consensus statements, because recurrence is still 50% in five years or more. I'll show you that. So we learned from the firm trial that if recurrence is likely, you have to keep your patient protected. So application, it's applicable to various patient populations, including the elderly. What about it? 
and while more and more is extending to the elderly, and more and more they're doing things to patients with long-standing, persistent, or so-called permanent injury. Food. So what is the role of post-ablation and drug therapy? This is all still evolving. So what I want to show you is this is a study published three years ago. It hasn't changed. Look at the average rate here. The, the average rate is in the fifth, primarily the 50s or the low 60s. That's really a small percentage of patients with atrial fibrillation. We already say now half are over 75. So you can understand that. So ablation may particularly benefit younger patients with lone atrial fibrillation, that is no structural heart disease, who are frequently symptomatic and for whom very long-term anaerobic and anaclactic therapy pose higher risks and lifestyle costs. Okay. Now, just to show, there have been two worldwide surveys uh, because people want to know what's happening. And this is what has been reported. Uh, this is in over 16,000 patients. Uh, I forget the number of sites, but this is not free. They're getting better, but it's not free of problems. I mean, some people die, and the death rate is 0.15. But that's still, people die. Tamponade, a, a, a little, almost 1.5%. Pneumothorax, hemothorax, sepsis. This is a permanent diaphragmatic paralysis because the, the diaphragmatic the vein runs right near the right superior pulmonary artery. You have to be very careful. Um, total, uh, total, uh, total febrile pseudoaneurysm. Um, strokes, uh, you're small, 0.2%, 0.23, but it's still had a TIA, 0.7%. Uh, atrial esophageal fistula, that is because the left atrium lies right on the esophagus. That sometimes when you're ablating with radio frequency ablation, particularly the heat, you, you create damage to the esophagus and you get a esophageal fistula, atrial esophageal. And this is often more, not more than very few. I only know one reported case where a patient survived, maybe there are a few others, but. Uh, Any fish valve damage, uh, pulmonary stenosis. This has virtually been eliminated. They used to go into the pulmonary vein to get rid of those pulmonary uh, uh, triggers. But, but what happened is the alphabetion made the vein get very, very narrow, and you had pulmonary stenosis, which the patient was worse off. But I left for the end this. This is because of all those lines that they make. There's an there's a almost 9% incidence of iatrogenic atrial flutter after these. That flutter around a line of block in the left atrium was round around. Those can be pretty hard to take care of. So, but don't forget Murphy's second law. Things that happen as good as they seem, nor as bad as they seem. It really applies to ablation. And these are data from, ha from Hessinger's lab. So it's one of the outstanding labs in the world for ablation. A very honest lab, a very rigorous lab. And they showed by five years of follow-up, freedom from recurrent age fibrillation was 63%, albeit with repeat intervention in half the patients. And gradual attrition and, and arrhythmia-free survival was seen with a 9% annual recurrence rate following the last ablation attempts. The long-term effectiveness of a single procedure was modest, only 29% arrhythmia-free in five years. So now we tell patients, expect to have a second procedure, and maybe more. So this is really important stuff. So all this you have to consider, and this consider age, as may be important in, a, in an 85-year-old or a 55-year-old, for instance. That might be some of the considerations. I can say that to make it pretty obvious. But. So, some issues. What makes this procedure more difficult than other radio frequency ablation procedures? Or, and, or, or that we have prior as well. So I already talked about AVNRT, that's AV node reentry with the bypass pathway. And this is AV, I mean, AV reentry with the bypass pathway, AV node reentry, um, or atrial flutter. It's an empiric procedure. What are the targets, what are the endpoints? We have targets and endpoints for these rhythms, which are NVT also. We are very, we're very good at ablating these. Efficacy rates, 98% or more. Uh, AF is probably a combination of different conditions with different mechanisms and different atrial areas of, and the substrate supporting the arrhythmia. The relationship between triggers and substrate is not understood. Left side ablation increases risk, especially for iatrogenic atrial flutter and even stroke. Difficult anatomy, but we're getting much, much better at all these things, by the way. Dependence on philosophy, that's really changing, and we have robotics here, uh, and so we really save a lot on, 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 on that. Uh, exposure to be different modalities of procedures that no two hospitals do it the same way, I guarantee you that. Long-term follow-up data have been disappointing. I already showed you. The end point for using oral and regulation is uncertain in these patients and, and controversial. The ablators take patients off after six months regardless if they're confident for the sinus rhythm. That's not what the consensus statement says. So who are candidates for ablation? Failure to respond to one or more, maybe even two anaerobic drugs. Paroxysmal and better than persistent permanent atrial, type of atrial fib. Not all the same. Paroxysmal is much easier. Age less than 75, 
that's changing. People are, are the, you can see that the patients are getting older, but not that much. But every every laboratory has patients in the 70s and 80s who have been done, but not the majority is still in their 50s and, and maybe early 60s. Mm -hmm. If the left atrium is markedly dilated, forget about it. It's not worth doing. Um, if they're very symptomatic with impaired quality of life, it's worth a try usually. Possibly with a contraindication of anticoagulation, possibly. Do have other treatments now for that? And we don't have time to go into today. But now, possibly with heart failure, we talked about some of that last time, but we can include the left atrial appendage or we can excise it, uh, uh, and we can include the endocardium, the epicardium. I'm willing to accept major complications of what percent. Well, flutter is 7.9%, 7.9%, 7.6%, almost 8%. Probably includes about a five to ten percent of patients who are really fulfill this of all the patients. It's not that many. So where are you with the guidelines? The recent guidelines that we have later for atrial fib. If you have no structural heart disease, the American College Cardiology Heart Association, the Heart Women Society, they recommend drugs first, having their own second or that or catheter ablation, second choice. The European Society says in selected patients you can go right to catheter ablation. The ones they're talking about are low atrial fibrillation without no structural heart disease and paroxysmal. And so, but, um, but mostly they say you should go here to the drugs and if that doesn't work, ablation, then go to cathode ablation or the amiodarone. Notice amiodarone is not the first choice. And this is the, uh, the Canadian Cardiovascular Society. You have the same thing, drugs first, cathode ablation, amiodarone second. So finally, where are we then? Maintenance designers are usually patient specific you need Individualized therapy may be a symptom driven decision, requires individualized drug selection as initial therapy, requires realistic objectives. AF recurrence is not failure per se. Reduction AF frequency and AF duration, duration and severity of associated symptoms is a, is a good endpoint. And reduction hospitalization is a good thing. Canics for ablation and techniques for ablation are still evolving. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you all for coming. Since we're all the time, if there's any questions, you can come forward to the front.